What's happening everybody? Trey here, joined again by my dad Sean. And today on Reactions to the Classics, we got a big one for you. We are going to be looking at George Harrison's triple album, All Things Must Pass. Crazily enough, I wasn't familiar with any of these tracks. I wasn't either. I thought I might be, you know. I mean, it's still released a year before I was born, but I was not either. Yeah, this was just a fantastic record. So oh. I'm, I'm really excited to just dive into this with you guys. And if this is your first time joining us here at Reactions to the Classics, we take a look back at some of the most classic albums of all time, do a detailed track-by-track -track review of them, and just like today, it's usually the first time we've heard the record. So if that sounds like something interesting to you, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button, and if you want to link up with us more, we have our Facebook and Patreon links down below. And before we dive into the quick facts, we're going to split this video up, y'all, into two different parts, just since it's such a huge record. So we'll have the quick facts and part of the record on this video and finish it out, give our scores favorite tracks on part two. But let's just dive into this. Well, Trey, this is the first studio album since the breakup of the Beatles, released in November of 1970. It's number 433 on the Rolling Stones' Top 500 Albums of All Time. I know a lot of people don't like the Rolling Stones list. I get it. It's a whole bunch of people that contributed to the list. It's kind of the best we got out there. But they really missed the mark on oh, this yeah. one. 433. <laughs> anyway, I digress. It's number one in the U.S. for eight weeks, number one in the U.K. for seven weeks. The album reflects the influence of Harrison's musical activities with artists such as Dylan, the band, and Delaney and Bonnie and Billy Preston from 1968 to 70 and his growth as an artist beyond the supporting role to Lennon and McCartney. It introduced Harrison's signature sound, the slide guitar, and those spiritual themes that will be present throughout his subsequent solo work, especially his next album. Production began at Abbey Road in May of 1970 with extensive overdubbing and mixing continuing through October. Sessions produced a double album's worth of material, most of it's still been unreleased. Brought in Phil Spector as co-producer, got the wall of sound rocking. And many think that the start of the journey of this record mm -hmm. came after the White Album in late 68. He went over, started a long-standing friendship with Bob Dylan and the band, yep. uh, visited them at Woodstock, New York, and was happy to know that he kind of had equal contribution and yeah. just uh, that, that camaraderie. They're, they respected George. Yeah, exactly. That he wasn't getting with John and Paul back in you know England with the Beatles. So that started to spark something in him as well as his return to the guitar um, away from the sitar and more Indian instrumentation mm -hmm. that he experimented with for multiple years. So once he returned back to London, his songs were being overlooked for inclusion on releases by the Beatles. So in January 1970, Harrison invited Spectre to participate in the recording of Lennon's Plastic Ono Band single, Instant Karma. This association led to Spectre being given the task of salvaging the Beatles' Let It Be album, and he later co-produced, as you mentioned, this record, All Things Must Pass. He thought it'd take no more than eight weeks to complete, but recording, overdubbing, and mixing lasted for five months. Part of the reason Trey had to make regular visits to Liverpool, mm -hmm. his mom had terminal cancer. Another problem was Spectre. Uh, he said Spectre couldn't really get going until he had 18 brandies in him. Uh, later on in July, they had to stop recording July of 1970 so he could go visit his mom one last time. Unfortunately, she passed away. And then Spectre fell down in the studio because he was so intoxicated, broke his arm. So basically, George produced most of this album on his own because Phil was really not in any shape to do it. That wraps up our quick facts, and we're going to dive into this record. So we got the first track. That Have You Any Time, co-written by Bob Dylan. So major, and Harrison's one of the only guys to ever write with Dylan, okay? <laughs> they actually have two two Dylan songs on this album, but they wrote this in Woodstock in November of 1968. Harrison and his then wife, Patty Boy, went and spent Thanksgiving with the mm -hmm. Dylans, which I thought was a pretty interesting conversation. And George later said that Bob seemed pretty withdrawn, like he was happy they were there, but kind of just Bob hadn't performed in a while. And by day three, they finally got, uh, Bob got his guitar out, George got his out, and they laid this thing down. The song really reflects the environment for which it was written. It's Harrison's verses urge the shy and elusive Dylan to let down his guard, and the Dylan composed choruses respond with a message of welcome. It's more a gentle or ballad, yeah. which goes against the grain for what you would think a rock and roll record would be. I thought this track was just fantastic you could definitely tell from the lyrics they were great that it had that dylan uh, oh yeah man that, that dylan influence in them and uh, it just really descriptive about love you want to go in and and grow on somebody know them and uh, there was a, a nice kind of clash between 
you you had the acoustic guitar and you also had a bluesy Eric Clapton on yeah here, Clapton's on a fantastic. lot of these yeah Clapton's on a lot of these I mean everybody seemed to have liked George everybody mm -hmm. showed up and kind of contributed that's gonna I, I mean I feel the same way yeah. it's an awesome song that's gonna lead us to my sweet Lord. I I didn't mention the quick facts Trey but really guys you got to understand like George was piling up these songs for years right mm -hmm. he would bring several of these and we'll get to which ones he brought to the Beatles and go, hey guys, how about this? Nope, 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 nope. Sorry, George, you only get one or two tracks. Yeah, so they recorded almost 50 tracks for this. It's almost like a greatest hits, even though none of them have been released, because he cherry picked the best songs. And My Sweet Lord is certainly up there. It's his most successful single ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it in fact has sold over 10 million singles. It's insane. Was the best selling single from any Beatle ever. It was wrote in praise of the Hindu god Krishna, while intending the lyrics as a call to abandon religious sectarianism. Lyrics reflect like the often stated desire for a direct relationship with God expressed in simple words that believers could affirm regardless of their religion. It's pretty smart what he did here. He devised a choral line singing the Hebrew word of praise, hallelujah, common in Christian and Jewish religions. Later in the song, after an instrumental break, these voices return now chanting the first 12 words of the Hare Krishna mantra. One of the most notable things is Harrison's slide guitar technique, very prominent in this whole album, but especially on this track, and you get that specter wall of sound treatment. You also had Billy Preston, Ringo was here. Ringo was here. Clapton yet again, the group Badfinger. So you had pretty much everybody in the kitchen sink contributing to and those this guys, song. Yeah, and those guys were on a lot of them. Now, George had said, before this album ever came out, he didn't want any singles released anywhere from it. He didn't want to detract his words from the triple album. But the U.S. head of Apple Records, Alan Steckler, along with the business manager, Alan Klein, along with Phil Spector, begged him to release this song. So he finally gave in. They released it in the U.S. Huge hit. Uh, didn't, wouldn't release it in the UK, but the UK radio stations played it anyway, Trey. So eventually later on, they released it there and became a gigantic hit. This song is so good. Oh, it just it is. sticks I in mean, your head. It is fantastic. I mean, I feel like I would have had to have heard it I before, thought, but... I thought at my age I would have had to have heard it, but I don't think but so. I, I didn't, and I, I just thought it was a, a great track. I liked the, uh, just the core, or the chorus backing vocals, the My Sweet Lord, Hallelujah, and just how it goes, it just... It's like an earworm, man. It just gets stuck in your it, head. It does get stuck in there. And he did, we got to touch on the controversy of this track. He did get sued for copyright infringement due to the similarity of the Ronnie Mack song, He's So Fine. It was a 1963 hit for the Chiffons, and in 76, Harrison was found to have subconsciously plagiarized the song. I listened to that track, and I will admit it does sound pretty similar yeah. to this, but I don't think George intentionally I don't think, it, and neither did the judge. And I yeah. think there's a whole huge backstory to this that we'll get into in the Digging Deeper for our Patreon people, because it's quite interesting. It really changed a lot that went on in the mm -hmm. music industry, and people came out of the woodwork, started suing the Beatles and everybody <laughs> else, but uh, this song is just... I would say it's a standout on the album, but there's a lot of standouts. Yeah, on yeah, to go one, two um, with our first two tracks, and then we go into track three, Wah Wah. Yeah, he wrote this following his temporary departure in January of 1969 from the Beatles during the very troubled get back mm -hmm. sessions that became Let It Be. He wrote this over his frustration with the atmosphere in the group at the time, namely McCartney's over assertiveness and criticism of his guitar playing. Lennon's lack of engagement with the project and dismissal of Harrison as a songwriter, and of course Yoko's constant involvement in the band's activities. Many recognize the song as Harrison's statement of personal and artistic freedom from the Beatles, recorded shortly after their breakup in 1970. It was the first song he recorded for this album. He noted when he came back in 1969 from his two month stay in the United States, he had so much fun there. And <laughs> then we get into Twickenham Studios, and he just said it was a, a drag. And mostly, as you mentioned, Paul McCartney me kind of overbearing on him yes. and telling him you got to play like this or that and then also frustrated at Lennon's emotional withdrawal and just withdraw from the band uh, with Yoko so he, he kind of was almost <laughs> the only pillar really that he really was, was stable in the Beatles and the thing that brought this to head on January 6 1969 their third day at Twickenham an argument was captured on the film where McCartney criticized Harrison's guitar playing on the song two of us Harrison told him quote I'll play whatever you want me to play. 
or I won't play at all if you don't want me to play. <laughs> Whatever it is that'll please you, I'll do it. He comes back two days later and debuts I, Me, Mine. Lennon ridiculed it. They had an argument during which Lennon dismissed Harrison's ability as a songwriter. He left, went home, and then he wrote this track. The song's fantastic for me. I mean, knowing what it's about and living through the whole Beatles mm -hmm. discography like we have over the last six months, it just really even lends more to it. So great track. I mean, these first three tracks, it's... Oh. Yeah, Fantastic. it's really ridiculously high input, and I like that Wawa is also the guitar type that's playing, yeah. and also Wawa, like you're crying, or something's over, but he said, hey, there's no more crying, no sighing, he's content with being his own man, and moving on from the group, and then we touch on some more heartfelt, yeah. virtuistic stuff, and isn't it a pity version one? And it appears in two variations on this record, which was the intent from the start, and this is the more well-known seven-minute version, he wrote it in 1966, but it was rejected for inclusion on Revolver. It's been described as the emotional musical centerpiece of the record. He has everybody on this one too. He has Preston, he has Badfinger. He explained it's about whenever a relationship hits a down point. It was a chance to realize that if I felt somebody had let me down, there's a good chance I was letting someone else down. And the lyrics are pretty complex when you read them. One sense they can be seen as a personal observation on a failed love affair, yet at the same time they can be a comment on the universal love for and among humankind. So he was the bigger man on this song. The lyrics tell you, and what he said about him, Trey, is that, hey, if, if I'm upset about somebody else, yeah. then they're probably upset about me. I probably had a failing in this as well, which you said it earlier, he's kind of the only adult in the room for a little while. I mean, Ringo too. Ringo just kind of stepped aside during this whole drama between mm -hmm. the other three. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great message that, hey, isn't it a pity how we take each other's love and then we don't give anything back. Generosity is a theme that runs throughout the track and the musical backing, again, is fantastic as it is throughout this entire record. And I, I just thought that it was a great way to end this first side, which is the strongest side, I think, on the entire... Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it's tough to top these first four tracks. That brings us to side two. We're going to start off with What Is Life? Harrison wrote it in 1969, originally for Billy Preston, uh, kind of an up-tempo soul genre song, although it, it's a song on here that reminds me the most of a Beatles sound to it. Yeah, it has a very fuzzy guitar playing. Yeah, like this descending <laughs> guitar riff. It's a top 10 hit. And with the lyrics, you know, it's a straightforward love song or a devotional towards God, which is what kind of that gray area on a lot of these songs that he didn't really ever clear up because I guess he figured either way, whatever the listener wants. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's the mark of a great songwriter where you can leave that interpretation yeah. to the listener to be like, if I'm feeling an interpretation this way, I can grasp at this or that. Uh, wow, what a fantastic, oh, I mean, terrific. we just continued. I know, I know. we're a broken record here, but this song is one of the highlights on the entire album. I, I agree. The first five, I mean, to come out five in a row like this is... And once the chorus comes in, one of George's more happy kind of vocal performance. Yeah. Great drums in here, and one of his better riffs, I think, that he has on this record. So, stand out. We have a Bob Dylan cover next. If not for you, we're big fans of Dylan here. Yes, the we are. So, he definitely permeates this record in a multitude of ways, and Bob actually first recorded this with Harrison in May of 1970. Yep. It recorded on his record, and then a month later, George came out with his version that we hear today, and there's a harmonica in there, a signature Dylan uh, instrument, as well as some just nice, it has a nice relaxing sound, and it's a great love song about, hey, I can't deal in this life, I'm confused without you, good things, bad things, it doesn't matter, I can't see the silver lining. Yeah, and on George's version, a little more melody-centric, mm -hmm. a little more the bridge and the verses are kind of brought up more. Dylan's is fine too, faster than what you're normally going to yeah. get with him, but I much prefer George's version. Just an excellent, beautiful song, as you said. Which brings us on that uh, subject, Trey, to Behind the Locked Door, which is a song that Harrison wrote for Dylan. Dylan had been away from being mm -hmm. on the stage. He's making a much publicized uh, return to the stage with the band as his backing band, and they were already the band by then, uh, at the Isle of Wight Festival. Um, he had skipped Woodstock famously, even though they had it in Woodstock because they <laughs> thought he would come. Uh, so George wrote this to encourage him. 
Yeah, and we have an organ in here, gives it a unique flavor, and you also have some country elements. Which yeah, definitely. Harrison didn't delve into that often, but it definitely worked here, and it just pretty much addresses Dylan about how Dylan's done so much for, and was such an inspiration to Harrison that he encouraged Bob to come out from behind that locked door. And then George said he's going to be by his side in that. And then that takes us to the next track, Let It Down, which again employs that wall of sound production technique. Sprash opening and courses contrast with the ethereal quality of the verses. So you have that loud, soft approach that has influenced many indie bands even up to this day. He wrote this back in 68, offered it for Let It Be, but it didn't get on record. And it's a little bit more of a straight up love song. Yeah. Uh, very passionate. You know, he's kind of seen this woman and he's visualizing her in his mind. He was visualizing if she was like next to him and just say, hey, let your hair down on me type of thing. So it was kind of different up to this point in the album. Yeah, a lot of big band, like you can hear the brass instruments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just comes in. You mentioned at the beginning the wall of sound. Uh, definitely apparent on this one. This song for me worked, Trey. I really liked it. Now, I liked it less than every track so far, but that's I'd saying, agree with that, yeah. that's saying I'm giving it a 90 instead of 100. The wall of sound, the brass instruments, it's a totally different sound. So I admire that, that we're just changing things up. So worked for me. Least favorite song, which, like I said, is uh, still high praise. Yeah, exactly. And then we're going to echo that into Run of the Mill, which is the closing track on this first disc. Harrison wrote it shortly after the troubled Get Back sessions in early 69. Lyrics reflect the toll that running Apple Corps had taken on relationships within the band, especially between McCartney and the other three, as well as Harrison's dismay at Lennon's emotional withdrawal that we talked about earlier from the band. Trey, this basically painted the picture that Paul was over here mm -hmm. and the other three were over here for a few years uh, right after the breakup. Yeah, and musically, this has some of the band influences yes. in here, and it really just notes some, has some tinges of regret, while also just telling the story of how it was, how, you know, running the mill was what they might have told George every yeah. now and then about his tracks. Yep. He notes in there, tomorrow when you rise another day for you to realize me or send me down again. I, George was probably sometimes out kind of in limbo knowing are they going to take my track today or are they going to you know be a little bit overbearing and he notes in there it's you that decides it's kind of not necessarily accusatory but it's put out there in, in front of them like okay it's you that decided this you're going to have to live now with the breakup of the band that's how I interpret it and uh, what's going to transire after it. Yeah, and I'd definitely advise you go seek out the lyrics on sure. this one for sure because it really... I'd say you, this was the biggest one that just like brought the breakup. In yeah, time. you just see it right there. And this album became famous later on, Trey. It was given the inside look after mm -hmm. the fact of the Beatles breakup because he wrote a lot of these during the process. Exactly. And it just was a great way, I thought, to end, oh, yeah. end off this B-side. Another fantastic song. What a disc, and we're going to cut it here right now, y'all. We'll have this two and three in our part two review, which will be linked down below if you're coming in a little after the fact, or be up in a couple of days if you're watching live. We appreciate you guys watching. Let us know what your favorite track was from disc one of All Things Must Pass. Dad, really appreciate the uh, research. Pleasure. And we'll be back with part two real soon. And until next time, y'all, thank you so much for watching. Happy listening, my friends, and we will see you.